So I've called this talk, How Not to Read the Gospels. And that's a, might sound like a kind of a harsh title, actually, because I'm really accusing someone of doing misreading. And if that person's a credentialed scholar, that's a hard thing to say. But I'm going to try to make the case that it is justified and maybe even something that it's important for us to say when someone is doing the kinds of things with the texts that we find this scholar doing. I'll give as my epigraphs for the talk two wise sayings. One of them is from Proverbs. The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. And the other wise saying is from Bart Ehrman. One should always know what the data are before deciding too quickly what the data mean. By the time I'm done with this presentation, I hope you can understand why I have chosen these as the epigraphs for this talk. Let's start by letting Bart say what he thinks. The sources, and by this he means the sources specifically regarding the resurrection, are hopelessly contradictory, as we can see by doing a detailed comparison of the accounts in the Gospels. This is from his work, The Historical Jesus, on page 90. I have tried to put in page references for everything like this that I'm quoting, and I will be sharing the slides with you. So if you were hoping to be able to check it up and find out whether I am quoting fairly and in context, I hope you do. And I'll make that easy for you by letting you have the slides and you can look up exact pages. The one thing I will say is pay attention to the dates on the books. Some of Bart's popular books have gone through multiple editions that have different pagination. So just to make sure you're looking it up in the same year as the edition that I'm citing before you accuse me of just fabricating something that Bart didn't say. Here's a statement from Bart Ehrman himself on methodology. Oh, whoops, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm clicking forward here. In order to resolve, he says, the tension between the gospels, the interpreter has to write his own gospel, which is unlike any of the gospels found in the New Testament. And isn't it a bit absurd to say that in effect only my gospel, the one I create from parts of the four in the New Testament is the right one and that the others are only partially right? Hmm. What's with that, the partially right thing? I think that's a loaded description. The gospel accounts are partial. They are incomplete. That does not mean what Ehrman wants to claim, that they positively assert falsehoods. Look, in fact, at John 20, verse 30. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. That is an overt claim to being incomplete. That's not the way that somebody writes who says, I have given you a complete account of everything. That's someone who says, of course. I'm not giving you everything. In fact, he goes on to say, if all the things that Jesus said and did were written, all the books in the world wouldn't be able to contain them. So of course they're partial. But incompleteness is not falsehood. Not unless it claims completeness. Let's take a specific example. Here's Bart asking what he thinks is a question that's going to zing you. On the third day after Jesus' death, the women go to the tomb to anoint his body for burial. And whom do they see there? Do they see a man, as Mark says, or two men, Luke, or an angel, Matthew? Now, anybody who's been working in apologetics at all for any length of time has encountered many things like this. And there's a perfectly simple traditional resolution. It runs like this. The women saw two angels. They looked like men, as angels often do, hence Luke's description. Matthew and Mark both focus on just one of them who does the talking. That's all. There's really nothing dramatic to see here. If many have entertained angels unawares, then that means that they looked like men and these people weren't aware that they were actually dealing with angels. That is a common theme that we see 
got running through scriptural description of angels only in a few places like maybe you know a passage or two in daniel do you see somebody who actually looks like he might have a parasail on his back or something you know be burning white or something something that would draw attention but often they're not whoever's just come in and put a microphone on please mute your own mic so that we don't have any feedback loops on the audio now bart actually admits that this would do the job that can explain everything else why matthew says he saw they saw an angel he mentions only one of the two angels doesn't deny there was a second why mark says it was a man the angels appeared to be men even though they were angels and mark mentions only one of them without denying there was a second and why luke says it was two men since the angels appeared to be men right so in that case what's the problem well bart says this kind of reconciling again requires one to assert that what really happened is unlike what any of the gospels say since none of the three accounts states that the women saw two angels this is from his book jesus interrupted on page eight now what exactly does he mean by unlike if he means that none of the gospel accounts is by itself identical with this reconstruction it's true and it doesn't matter none of them claims to be a complete account if they are accurate each in its own way that's all that we need but if he means that they are in conflict with this harmonization then it is not true and that's the only meaning that would really do him any good so bart's treatment of this where he acknowledges, yeah, you know, that would deal with it, and then tries to throw sand in our eyes by saying something about writing your own gospel. No, we're just putting them together. We harmonize multiple accounts like this in secular history all the time. One of my scholarly specialties is the history of science. And when you have multiple people writing about the same events or the same era, they often give you complementary descriptions which you have to put together to develop a sort of multi-layered appreciation for what's going on that does not mean that any of the documents is telling you things that are false they might be but the mere fact that none of them is complete does not by itself mean that they are not true not having the whole truth is different from not being wholly true Here's another example. And in this case, I think we're actually going to get to see some of the shadiness of the way that Bart treats the text itself. Who actually went to the tomb? Was it Mary alone? John 20, verse 1. Mary and another Mary, Matthew 28, 1. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, Mark 16, 1. Or women who had accompanied Jesus from Galilee to Jerusalem, possibly Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and other women, Luke 24, 1, see Luke 23, 55. This from his book, Jesus Interrupted. Now, if you're reading a passage like that, and the author is putting these references out there ostentatiously, it is easy to feel bullied easy to feel that this is somebody who's really laid a trap for you and boy have you walked into it and now what are you going to do because he's got all these references at his fingertips so let me tell you a story about 10 years ago i knew a young woman who was an adult convert to christianity college student lovely girl um just sweet and we were talking a little bit about it. She knew that I was into apologetics. And she said to me, you know, when I first became a Christian, I went down to the library. I was so excited. I wanted to learn more about Jesus. So I went to the shelves and I pulled off the shelf the first book I saw that had the word Jesus in the title. And it was Jesus Interrupted by Bart Ehrman. And I started reading it. And I just got more and more confused. And finally, I, I put it back on the shelf. And I didn't know what to think, but I felt guilty ever since. Like I was running away from questions and problems. And so I said to her, I have a very well annotated copy of that book. Why don't you go ahead and get it and bring it. 
and I will meet you with you every week in this coffee shop. Start anywhere. Ask anything. And we will discuss these until you have a satisfied mind. And so we did. For a couple of months, we met weekly at the coffee shop and she would bring up the questions going through Bart's book, sometimes hopscotch, sometimes sequentially asking me about particular things and we would talk about them. And the first thing that I taught her to do when he does something like this is open up your Bible and read the texts for yourself. And so with a little bit of timidity and trepidation, she did that. This was one of the ones that we talked about. Who actually went to the tomb? Was it Mary alone? John 20, verse 1. Okay, let's break this down. Let's start right there. Was it Mary alone? John 20, verse 1. John 20, verse 1 doesn't say that Mary was alone. All that it says is that Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and then went to Peter and John. It doesn't say she was alone. In fact, if you read one verse further along, when she speaks to Peter and the disciple Jesus loved, she says, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know. That's the amen ending on the verb here, uk oidemen, not we know where they have laid him. So if it was supposedly Mary alone, how come she's speaking in the plural here? Even simply reading one verse further along shows you that John knows that she didn't go to the tomb alone. She may have come from it to Peter and the other disciple alone, but it's we who don't know where they have laid him, not I. Let's keep going. Mary and another Mary, Matthew 28, 1. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus and Salome, Mark 16, 1. Fact. Neither of those verses, please look them up for yourself. Please read them for yourself. Claims to have a complete list. In fact, even the bit that he quotes from Luke has this phrase, other women in it, which is as good as an admission that the lists are not intended to be comprehensive. He's naming some sources, maybe some representative people, maybe some people he personally talked to, and there were others. Incompleteness is not incorrectness. If it were, wow, what a broad swath we could burn through secular history. Difference is not disagreement. Two accounts don't have to be identical for both of them to be true. In fact, if they were identical, what would be the very first thing we would be likely to say about them? Oh, one of these writers copied from the other one. And that might actually be a plausible explanation if they said the same thing in the same words. We apply this kind of methodology constantly in secular history. This is not some special thing that Christian apologists do that historians don't understand or would frown upon. No, this is something historians have to do all the time. We encounter these sorts of things constantly in secular history. I have many examples, but let's just take one of them from United States history. On the morning of July 18th, 1776, a copy of the Declaration of Independence arrived in Boston and someone read it to the assembled crowd below from the balcony of the old state house in Boston. Who read it? Well, we have early sources that say it was William Greenleaf. He was the high sheriff of Suffolk County. Unfortunately, we also have equally early sources that say on that day, on that morning, it was Colonel Thomas Crafts, who was not the same person as William Greenleaf. He didn't like have a, a pen name or a, a secret identity or something. These are different people. We have equally early sources saying it was each of them. Well, it can't be both, right? So this is a problem. This is a contradiction. You know what the truth is? We have an additional source besides all of those sources that tells us what really happened. Greenleaf had a weak voice, but he was the person who, 
in point of legal responsibility had both the right and the obligation to read this. So he stood on the balcony and he read it, but the crowd couldn't hear him. So Colonel Crafts repeated it after him sentence by sentence loudly enough for everyone to hear. There was an apparent contradiction, but it was caused not by what the sources said, but by something else that we brought into the reading, namely that it couldn't be both people. It couldn't have been two people on the same morning from the same place to the same crowd, but it was. Imagine the scorn that would be heaped upon any New Testament scholar who tried to resolve an apparent contradiction this striking in the Gospels by means of a device like this. Now, lacking a document, it would be conjectural, but truth is stranger than fiction sometimes. These kinds of things are by no means unknown. I have many, many more examples of this kind. I'm going to take pity on you and not go through them simply because uh, I don't want to wear out your patience and I want to leave lots of time for questions and answers afterward. Here's a legal view of testimony this from Thomas Starkey's Practical Treatise on the Law of Evidence, which is a major work of Anglo-American jurisprudence from the 19th century. It is here to be observed that partial variances in the testimony of different witnesses on minute and collateral points, although they frequently afford the adverse advocate a topic for copious observation, are of little importance, unless they be of too prominent and striking a nature to be ascribed to mere inadvertence inattention or defect of memory. In other words, little variations, not a big deal. Not even if we don't know how to reconcile them, not even if they are actually irreconcilable. Although the adverse advocate, the lawyer on the other side, may go on and on about them, which is kind of what Bart Ehrman is like. Starkey goes on, it so rarely happens that witnesses of the same transaction perfectly and entirely agree in all points connected with it, that an entire and complete coincidence in every particular, so far from strengthening their credit, not unfrequently engenders a suspicion of practice and concert. They got their talking points all lined up in advance. J. Warner Wallace, who's a cold case homicide detective turned Christian apologist, has remarked much to the same effect, that the little variations in witness testimony, they don't bother him a bit. He's used to it. He's talked to a lot of eyewitnesses. He's interviewed eyewitnesses. He knows what that testimony is like. Let's go further. Here's Bart Ehrman on the end of Mark. One point in particular seems to be irreconcilable. In Mark's account, the women are instructed to tell the disciples to go meet Jesus in Galilee, but out of fear, they don't say a word to anyone about it. Now, what's the deal with that claim? The deal is our oldest complete manuscripts of the Gospel of Mark end at verse 8, even though Mark 16 in other editions like the King James Version are based on later manuscripts that go all the way to verse 20. Mark 16, 8 says, and they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. And that's where the manuscripts stop. Is that where Mark stopped? Is that where the second evangelist stopped writing? Answer, we don't know. Notice the oddness though of saying, they said nothing to anyone. I mean, clearly, Mark knows the story, right? He's writing it down. He had to get it eventually from somebody who got it from them or from them themselves. So it can't be on pain of just outright inconsistent with, see, with his own writing that they never told anybody ever. But that's the meaning Bart needs. So in each of the other three Gospels, the women tell the disciples what happened. Bart wants to create a contradiction by reading Mark as saying that they never said a word to anyone. Is that the right reading of Mark? Let's concede, at least for the sake of argument, and maybe he's actually right about this, that our manuscripts, our best manuscripts of Mark end with verse eight. So there's not anything further that actually comes from the pen of Mark. Let's just grant that for the sake of argument. 
So nearly all scholars now agree that the long ending wasn't part of the original text, but there's disagreement regarding whether this was the original intended ending of the gospel. That's what Bart Ehrman believes or whether it rep represents a place where the narrative was broken off, either never completed or with the original conclusion now being lost. Bart's dissertation director, Bruce Metzger, thought it was probably broken off at that point, maybe because Mark just hadn't finished it up. Maybe a copy of it had been made, but the last page of it had been lost or damaged. And this is all they had either way. It is not clear, let's just put it that way very mildly, it's not clear that it was intended to end with this, but they told no one for they were afraid. But let's go further. Let's look at that for they told no one for they were afraid. Let's uh, look at Mark's typical usage and see what it would mean if there had been something more to it, which is now lost. Let's look at Mark 537. And he allowed no one to follow him. What would be the impression if that were broken off at that point? Well, that Jesus didn't let anybody follow him at all. Oh, but the next phrase is, except, except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. So no one except for these three people. Mark 9, 8. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them. What if it were broken off there? Well, it looked like the three of them were alone, but Jesus only. Oh, except for Jesus. Mark 9, 9. He charged them to tell no one what they had seen. If Mark stopped there, or if our manuscript were broken off there, we would think that Jesus said, never tell anybody this. But actually, Mark's usage frequently issues a blanket negative like that followed by the qualifier until the son of man had risen from the dead these are not isolated uses this is how mark writes quite typically mark 10 18 jesus sort of tweaking the nose of someone who has called him good master why do you call me good no one is good except god alone blanket negative exception Mark 13, 32, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father, blanket negative, exception. So what this usage suggests about Mark is that if indeed this is not the place where he intended to end, but just the place where our manuscript happens to be broken off, then the original ending might have run something like this and told no one, for they were afraid, but running to the disciples, they told them all that they had seen and heard. And in fact, that's very similar to what we do read in Matthew 28, verse 8. That blanket negative followed by the exception is very much the language that Mark uses. So let's go on to a third example. Uh, Bart finds a contradiction in John. This is one of the examples I love to hate. Uh, and, and this one's actually kind of important. Uh, in John's gospel, Jesus performs his first miracle in chapter two. This is true. Uh, where he turns the water into wine. Bart says this is a favorite miracle story on college campuses. And we're told that this was the first sign that Jesus did, John 2, 11. I want you actually to look at that and, and read that maybe two or three times. Focus on that. This was the first sign that Jesus did. Close quote, John 2, 11. Look at exactly what Bart has done, how he has quoted the text there. Burn that into your mind. Later in that chapter, Bart continues, we're told that Jesus did, quote, many signs, close quote, in Jerusalem, John 2.23. And then in chapter four, he heals the son of a centurion and the author says, this was the second sign that Jesus did, close quote. Notice what he says. This is the second sign that Jesus did, stops the quotation right there, John 4.54. And now Bart is ready for a chuckle. Huh? One sign, John chapter two, Many signs, end of the chapter, and then 
The second sign, funny, can't John count? Well, this must actually be a seam in the text where we see two pieces that don't belong together being woven together, sort of sewn up, stitched up together. But actually, we clever readers, we can detect that because there's a mathematical oddity about it, this wasn't really the way the document read initially. Very clever, very wise, very scholarly. What's the first thing that you do? when Bart Ehrman quotes a text and gives you the reference. Read it for yourself. My friend came to the point where every day when we would meet, she would sit down and we'd look at a contradiction or an alleged contradiction. I'd say, and what's the first thing we do? And she'd say, we read it for ourselves. I have not lived in vain. I got her to do that. And what happens when we read these things for ourselves? Well, we find out that John has been interrupted. Here's what those verses actually say. John 2, 11. This, the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee. Those words Bart did not see fit to quote. John 4, 54. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. Oh, but he didn't give us that part. One sign in Galilee, many signs in Jerusalem, which is not in Galilee, that's in Judea. And then a second sign in Galilee. What's so mysterious about this? Where's the problem? Well, he doesn't actually say that he's counting the ones in Galilee. Now, he doesn't say that in so many words, but it's perfectly obvious when you read it what he's done. It's also perfectly obvious that by leaving out the in Galilee part in both of those passages, Bart has managed to conceal from his readers a perfectly natural explanation that would have suggested itself if he had quoted more than the little carefully carved out snippets that he did. It is a hard thing to say, but in my judgment, this is not the work of an honest man. He's deliberately trying to pull one over on his readers. I don't appreciate that as a reader. I don't appreciate it as somebody who has to counsel people who are thrown off balance by Bart Ehrman's shenanigans. Here's another example about the triumphal entry from Matthew 21. In Matthew, says Bart, Jesus' disciples procured two animals for him, a donkey and a colt. They spread their garments over the two of them, and Jesus rode into town, straddling them both. It's an odd image, but Matthew made Jesus fulfill the prophecy of scripture quite literally, riding on an ass and on a colt, the foal of an ass. Ha, 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 he's doing a circus trick. He's riding both animals at once. How funny. Really? What's the first thing that we do when Bart quotes scripture? We read the text for ourselves. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. What's the antecedent of that last them? Is it the donkey and the colt, or is it their cloaks? Well, grammatically, either one could be it. But when we look at A.T. Robertson's commentary on Matthew, and Robertson was a great Greek scholar, Robertson just dryly remarks the garments, of course. The words in Greek might refer to the two animals, but such reference is by no means necessary. Matthew is not careful to distinguish, but common sense can do it. Let's not be stupid. Enough said. But you see what Bart did? He gets a chuckle out of his audience and he moves on, having made the authors of scripture seem to be bereft of common sense, where in fact, a little common sense would save us from that interpretation. Read the text for yourself. Engage just a tiny bit of real world imagination about how this would be written, what it would be, what it might mean. And the problems that he's trying to raise will frequently dissolve all by themselves occasionally 
there's one that's more complex that requires a little more effort to dig into. Let's let him have his best shot. This, I think, is the best one he's got. And it's one that has persuaded a number of evangelical scholars to just go along with Bart in order to seem like, well, we're, we're not just opposed to him on every point. We're going we're gonna to give him this one. So here's Bart from Jesus Interrupted. In Mark's gospel, he says, Jesus lived through that day, which is the day before the Passover, had his disciples prepare the Passover meal and ate it with them before being arrested, taken to jail for the night, tried the next morning and executed at 9 o'clock a.m. on the Passover day. But not in John. In John, Jesus dies a day earlier on the day of preparation for the Passover. Whoa. Huh. So Mark and John have Jesus die on different days, really? Yeah, you guessed it. We're going to read the texts for ourselves. Mark 14, 12. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And then the Last Supper follows. That's clearly a Passover Seder. That's the meal that is celebrating you celebrate that with the lambs. They've slaughtered them for Passover. So on that first day of that feast, that's what they do. John 19, describing the scene where Jesus is condemned to be crucified, says, Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. de parascue tu pascha. Notice, preparation of the Passover. It's just a genitive. Bart translate that, translates it preparation for the Passover. So in Mark, the Last Supper takes place on the first day of Passover. That's correct. According to Bart, the crucifixion in John takes place on the day of preparation for the Passover, which would be the day before the Passover. Is he right? more focus on what John really says. He doesn't say it was the day of preparation for the Passover. He says it was day of preparation of Passover. You say, uh, that might be the same thing. Well, but Mark uses that same term, preparation, but Mark also tells us what it means. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath. Not the day before the Passover, but the day before the Sabbath. Hmm, that's what preparation means. In other words, preparation is preparation for Sabbath, not preparation for the Passover. Parascue in Greek has always been the Jewish way of referring to Friday, the day before the Sabbath, preparation for the Sabbath. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, John says, for that Sabbath was a high day. Notice the parenthetical remark. There are no parentheses in Greek, but it is just a passing remark. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. For that Sabbath was a high day. So John agrees that it was the day before the Sabbath, which is exactly what Mark says when he says... It was preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So actually, John is agreeing with Mark about that. But that Sabbath was a high day. Why is it a high day? It's a high day for the same reason that many Sundays come and go, but Easter Sunday is a high Sunday in the Christian church. It's not just any Sunday. It's Sunday in Easter. This Sabbath was not merely any Sabbath. It was the Passover Sabbath. It was the high Sabbath of the Passover feast. Hmm. All right, that sounds plausible. But there are three more questions that we have to untangle. And that's why I said this is, this is the best one Bart's got. So let's chase it all the way to the ground. First question, what does John mean when he says it was a high day? He means it's a particularly special feast day, not just any Sabbath day. Second question, what about John 18, 28? 
Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled but could eat the Passover. Uh-oh. If Passover meal has already been had on Friday night, according to Mark, and according to John, they don't want to be defiled because they want to eat the Passover. Do we have a problem? Doesn't this contradict the claim that Passover had already taken place? Well, let's dig into that a little bit deeper. Passover is not just one day. It's a week-long festival. Passover strictly was initially a one-day celebration, but it got connected with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And when the Jewish historian Josephus writes about it in the first century, Josephus says that by Passover, they mean the whole eight day long feast of Passover with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which immediately follows it. He says that explicitly multiple times. So that's a first century Palestinian source writing in Greek, telling us what was meant by Passover. It's the week long festival. In every other case where John uses it, it refers to the festival as a whole, not to the opening meal. The supper on that opening night is not the only ritual meal eaten during Passover. There's another ritual meal the following day called the Chagiga, and it's a midday meal. I repeat, the Seder is an evening meal. It happens after sunset, beginning of the next day on the Jewish reckoning. The Chagiga is a noontime, middle of the day meal. Which of those did they say they wanted to eat? Well, first let's just go ahead and nail down some of this Josephus usage. As this happened at the time when the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which we call Passover, dot, 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 okay? As the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which we call Passover, was being celebrated, so that's Jewish usage. And now here's the curious point. If the chief priests had entered Pilate's dwelling and been defiled by so doing, maybe there was something dead that had been there and they didn't know it, but they couldn't take the risk. Their defilement, their ritual defilement would end at sundown. All they would have to do is wash and they would be ceremonially clean for the evening meal. So if it's an evening meal they want to eat, then there's no problem and there would be no reason for them not to want to enter his dwelling. If it's an evening meal, easy peasy. Go in, do whatever, come back out, wait for sundown, wash your hands, you're good to go. So if they're concerned about some meal, then it's got to be some meal other than the evening meal. So their worry here can't have to do with the initial Seder in Passover, which is an evening meal. If the Seder was already over, they must have been concerned about the next meal, probably a daytime meal because that would make their concern a legitimate one. You can't just wash your hands and say, I'm good for lunch, not according to Jewish law as it was followed at that time. So probably concerned about the Chagiga. In other words, at that point, everything now fits together. And John and Mark are saying exactly the same thing. And Bart is just wrong, as are people like Mike Lacona who take Bart to be right about this. That's just a mistake. And it's a mistake that comes about through failure to think about what ritual defilement means and what it would take to get over that. You can read all about this in Alfred Adersheim's book, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. Adersheim was raised Jewish and was a Christian convert. So his testimony on this is particularly interesting. How about question number three? Isn't the meal in John 13 a different meal from the Last Supper in the Synoptic Gospels? Well, let's look. Bart says, they do eat a final supper together, but in John, Jesus says nothing about the bread being his body or the cup representing his blood. Instead, he washes the disciples' feet, a story found in none of the other Gospels. If omission were contradiction, this would matter. This would be serious. But in fact, omission is not contradiction. And we can tell that it's the same meal because there are two undesigned coincidences that are interlocked between these accounts. Luke 22, Jesus says, who is the greater, 
one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. What is Jesus referring to there? This is Luke's account of the Last Supper. Bart would acknowledge that. What is Jesus referring to? Read all the way back through Luke 22, go back into Luke 21, Luke 20, different scenes. There's no indication what Jesus is talking about. But if you put Luke 22 down alongside of John 13, then you find Jesus rose from supper, laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples feet. Oh, there's an object lesson in servanthood that he could easily have been referring to by saying, I am among you as one who serves. Did you see what I just did? Did it make an impression? Were you tracking with me? That suggests that it was the same meal. Only John records the event that makes sense of Jesus' statement in Luke. But the other undesigned coincidence has to do with the question, why in John does Jesus wash their feet? It sort of comes up abruptly in John 13. Jesus, having loved his disciples, loved them to the end. And as they sat at the meal, he rose and laid aside his garment, it girded himself with a towel, etc., etc. But why? Nothing in John 13 gives us an indication of why. But Luke tells us what they were discussing as they came in from being outdoors right there in the context of the Last Supper. And what were they discussing? A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. So Luke mentions the dispute that explains why Jesus gave them this object lesson in servanthood. You can't see that unless you put Luke and John together and then it comes out in stereoscopic 3D and you get to see what's really going on because the texts interlock with one another and explain one another. But they do this only if these meals are in fact both the same meal. Yes, you have the words of institution in Luke that you don't find in John for the Last Supper. This is my body, this is my blood. Yes, you have the foot washing going on in John, but not in Luke. Incompleteness does not mean falsehood. All accounts are incomplete at some level of detail, and a good thing too, they'd be awfully tedious to read if they weren't. Art is manufacturing problems. I'll close with the words of one of the great theologians of all time, Sherlock Holmes. It is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. <laughs>